Hi, this is O'Connor. Welcome back. Global Supply Chain Management, but this is a week where we talk about blockchain. Wow, blockchain, it's the solution for everything. No, it's not. But is it the solution for supply chains? Yes, in some cases, no in other cases. In this session, I want to show you how it can work, when it can work, and when it may not work. What are the benefits? What are the costs? Or getting back to the basics, what is blockchain? And what are the elements of the supply chain that really make blockchain an amenable technology to enhance the efficiency of various supply chain parts? Stay tuned. Let's get into this, shall we? Okay, let's just remind ourselves, a supply chain is basically the linkage of a whole chain of, pro of procurement, production and distribution and sales events. Beginning with the raw material, going to a supplier, manufacturing, distribution and a customer. But what is it about the supply chain that makes it possibly inefficient or ineffective as a way of managing goods from their origin to final consumption. Well, currently supply chains around the world, they generally have separate legacy systems. There's the procurement system that may be different from the production system, that may be different from the distribution system. There are solar silos of information. In organizations, you have different departments and they're not always talking to each other. Sometimes when you make a sale, then you may find out, well, hang on, there's no inventory to match that sale and then the customers are not too happy. Wouldn't it be good when you're making sales to know if there's inventory available? Then you need to talk to production. Then you need to talk to procurement. There's a lot of communication that needs to go on between sales, production, procurement and various other departments in the organization, let alone the supply chain. Generally, supply chains around the world are paper based. And as I just mentioned, there's a lot of redundant and duplication of efforts. There is so much documentation required to get goods to FOB that's free on board to the country that you are selling into. There can be discrepancies for what information a supplier puts onto the documentation to what you expect to see at the other end of the port where you're receiving goods. Of course, goods as they are going through these different processes are vulnerable to tampering but also the documentation associated with those goods are vulnerable to tampering so you've got all these issues associated with a supply chain can the blockchain solve any of these problems in the global supply chain yes it can and where can it solve those problems how can it solve those problems before we get into that what does the blockchain supply chain look like? The blockchain supply chain is a way of connecting the information amongst all of these different silos, amongst all of these different departments. People call such system a permission system. In other words, it's kind of private. And it's also dependent on some element of cryptography. And I'll talk about that shortly. Okay, so let's have a look at what I'm going to cover in today's session. First of all, I'm going to look at basic blockchain building blocks. That's the first part. And we're not going to go into full detail, but I want to give you a flavor of what do we mean by a blockchain and what are the key elements of a blockchain. Next, I'm going to look at the supply chain benefits. That is the probable benefits. What is the elements of a supply chain that make it amenable to a blockchain? where the blockchain helps improve the efficiency, reduces the costs, eliminates waste, and reduces any errors, redundancy, and increases trust. They're the type of benefits we're looking for if we want to apply a technology to the supply chain. Finally, I want to end up with illustrating some case examples of where blockchain is effectively being used in supply chains today. All right, blockchain building blocks. This is interesting because I've been studying the blockchain for oh, over 12, 18 months now, and mainly in the FinTech area, cryptocurrency area, but 
the principles are largely the same. There are three general parts. There's a cryptography component, and I'll talk about that in a minute. There are the oracles, and the oracles refer to the nature of evidence that's coming from outside the blockchain that allows a smart contract to work. And also there is the consensus mechanisms, whether it's private, whether it's public, etc. Let's have a look at these three areas separately. First of all, cryptography. Now, I'm not here to give you a computer science lesson, but I just want to make you familiar with the notion of what does SHA-256 hash algorithm mean? Well, basically, it's a 256-bit algorithm made up of hexadecimal code. So what does hexadecimal mean? Well, it means 0 to 9 plus A, B, C, D, E, F. Pretty sure there's 6 on top of that. All right, so you've got 6 plus 0 to 9. So therefore, you've got 16 different states for each character in any one line of code. Ah, so that makes that code, when you switch those character characters around, it makes it so that there's so much more to the nth degree possibilities of different codes being made for the set number of characters in that code. A hash is generated through the SHA-256 whenever you put some data into a block. And in this case, we may put in hello, and out comes from that is a hash. If we put hello with an S on the end, that hash turns out to be totally different. Next, we have a look at a block, and that's where we have a nonce, where we have the data and the hash. And the purpose of the nonce is to actually just to provide a header for that particular block. Each block contains data, and then there's a, a hash algorithm that is produced on the basis of the data that is in that block for a particular nonce. Ah, so where does the blockchain come into it? Well, that's where we go to the bottom part, where we start to link a lot of these blocks by showing the previous hash. As you can see down the bottom, the hash that was calculated by the first block now becomes the previous hash in the second block, and then that becomes welded into the second block and cannot be changed. And the data in the second block is now transferred into a new hash at the bottom of the block. And then that new hash goes as a previous hash in the third block. And as you can see, we start to chain all of these blocks together. Now, the important thing to do with cryptography is to make sure that when these blocks are chained together, that if we change any one of those blocks, it's, it's going to upset the links between the blocks set up by the hash of a particular block and the previous hash of the next block and the block hash of that block and the previous hash in the next block. Ah, so the hashes become the chains between the blocks which contain the data. Ah, that's our blockchain. I'm not going to go into this in any more detail, but there is a demo that you can go and have a look at for more information, and I've provided a hot link in this slide. So we could envisage a blockchain looking like blocks of data, as we can see here, and hence we have the nonce, which is a header for the block. We have the data inside, and this is like a ledger between Darcy and Bingley, Elizabeth and Jane, Wickham and Lydia, and so forth. These are recording data transfers between different parties in the blockchain. And then there is the previous hash. And because this is the first block, as you can see the previous, it's zero. And then a hash is created based on the data in the data of the block. Then that hash goes to the previous header of the next block, and then a hash is created on the data in that block, hence creating a link between these two blocks in the blockchain. Let's have a look at the next part of what makes up a blockchain, and that is oracles. And you're probably thinking, what is an oracle? Is that someone in the matrix? Or is that a Fortune 500 company? Well, it's both. But an oracle in the computer science sense or the cryptography sense 
for a blockchain refers to the source of an external data that enables a smart contract to be triggered. So for example, when a product is loaded onto a ship, maybe the RFD is scanned. And so immediately that scanning of the RFID on that product triggers an event that is the shipment of that product. Ah, so the scanning on the RFID becomes the Oracle and then that data goes into the blockchain that triggers a next stage of the blockchain which is registering the transaction of that shipment. Ah, wow. So we've got the blockchain that has the data of the shipment, but that data is being updated by this external oracle. Ah, wow. Is it that complicated? No, it's not that complicated. Now, we've just got to remember when we are applying this to the supply chain, oracles are not everywhere, but the most common one in the supply chain that's putting to use today is the use of barcode scanners is the use of RFID, okay? There are other types of oracles that are software type, and also there are human variants of oracles. That's all you need to know for now, but just remember, when we go through a supply chain, we're going through different stages. And if we were to set up a smart contract, instead of getting humans involved, we may have to rely on a hardware type oracle to trigger various gates which physical products are moving through. And that's what we mean by an oracle. So an oracle contributes to the blockchain by providing an external trigger to go to the next stage or to the next block in the blockchain. It triggers a transaction. It triggers the fact that products have moved from A to B. Ah. Wow. Okay. So we've got cryptography, if that's not enough. We've got oracles, if that's not enough. What's next? Consensus protocols. Wow. We know all about this. Why? Because of Bitcoin, don't we? Yes. And we all think Bitcoin is the blockchain. Well, Bitcoin is an example of the blockchain, but blockchain isn't Bitcoin and Bitcoin isn't blockchain, all right? Blockchain is the underlying technology. Bitcoin is an application of blockchain, okay? So why am I talking about Bitcoin here? Bitcoin is probably the most famous example of a public blockchain. What do we mean by public blockchain? Well, anywhere around the world today, there are between 8,000 and 11 thousand miners, that is people with computers, corporations with computers that are endlessly and continuously mining hashes. So they can get rewards to actually establish the next block in the Bitcoin blockchain. Ah, wow. Are you going to explain how that mining works? No, not really. All I want to explain now is that when you have a public blockchain, the main incentive is provided by, from Bitcoin, is that you receive Bitcoins when you get to mine the hash that becomes the proper set for the next block of transactions in the Bitcoin blockchain. And the purpose of mining is to create a proof of work mechanism to make sure that not just anyone could set up a computer and mine for Bitcoin today. It takes a lot of computing power. It takes a lot of resources. And so you have to do a lot, a lot of proof of work to actually earn that Bitcoin payout to get that hash algorithm to establish the next block in the Bitcoin blockchain. Ah, so that's the public blockchain. But for the purposes of the supply chain, it's most likely that we're working with a private blockchain. And there are different types of private blockchains, and I'll talk about that. But for now, the main thing you need to know is that there are enterprise private blockchains like Ripple, and that's in the fintech area. And banks are a good example of that. And then there are consortium blockchains like Libra. And often consortium blockchains are the best fit for blockchains to be used in the supply chain. 
and a consortium could be a group of companies that are working with Maersk as a shipper. And an example about that I can talk about later. So what do we mean by private blockchains again? Well, the difference between public and private blockchain is that private blockchains are permission. In other words, you cannot become part of a blockchain unless you are granted permission. Maybe you have to be the logistics forwarder. Maybe you have to be the procurement department of a major distributor in a Western developed country. Maybe you have to be a factory to be part of a private blockchain. And that's how they set them up. And in that way, because they're made private, they don't have to create this incentive mechanism to have thousands of miners around the world to do this proof of work. Wow. Wow. I thought it was just Bitcoin mining. No, Neil. No, no, no. There's more to blockchain than just Bitcoin, please. All right. So when we talk about blockchain in the supply chain, most likely we are talking about a private blockchain. So just as a summary of what blockchain is about, there are, there's cryptography, there's a cryptography hash algorithm, the SHA-256. There are the oracles that help provide triggers for various gates that physical product may go through during the supply, procurement, production, distribution process. And also there's the consensus algorithm, which is basically the governance mechanism that surrounds the blockchain. And for the most part in the supply chain, the governance consensus algorithm is a private blockchain or a consortium blockchain. Next, I want to talk about the supply chain benefits. So stay tuned as we come back shortly. <music> 